Laptop Retrospective In Color Starring Laptop Retrospective Also starring ThinkPad X220 Tonight's special guest star, General Dynamics, Vitronics Dual Touch 2. Tonight's episode, Abort, Retry, or Fail. The name's Laptop Retrospective. My job, looking into antiquated hardware. Is this like any other day, really? A stack of files on my desk, different computers that I had to look through. But the chief gave me something pretty weird. It was an old story, General Dynamics. They'd changed hands so many times, it was like a handshaking convention. The computers themselves were ultra rugged, portable, touch screen. They had a lot of features, some antiquated even by today's standard, some actually pretty forward thinking. The specs were there, Everything seemed to be going all right. However, there was a severe, severe problem. In the world of tablets and portable electronics, this is absolutely massive. And I knew that I really had my work ahead of myself. I was pretty sure the battery was quite toast. It was barely at 6% was able to get it working, including all of the main functions, however. Including the touch screen. The digitizer mode. Even screen rotation seemed to be functioning correctly. But how well was this thing really built? And how durable would it have been? Minus the battery, of course. Well, the only way to find that out was to get inside. The computer came to me in this weird leather or leatherette carrying pouch. It was quite clear that this was not designed for the car. However, there was a kit that I knew that would do the job. Honestly, this seemed cumbersome and pointless. There was even Velcro, a place to hold the pen, the works that you'd normally expect. The carrying satchel had to be gone. So we opened it up and undid the zipper. First time that's what we could really see. The unit came out like a brick, which is appropriate considering that it had more in common with a brick perhaps than a computer. This thing was tough. It was built rugged. And for the time, it had a very high selection of ports. The bottom was some kind of docking connector. Next to that was the power supply. Moving along the other side, we found even more flaps. Modem. Two USB 2.0 ports. An absolutely massive compact flash slot. Headphone and microphone jacks. Along the top, we had network. And smart guard. On the back, we had access to the digitizer pen. The display could be switched, as I mentioned in my report, between the digitizer and the touch display. Neither is a fantastic experience, but considering the time, the technology, but not the price tag, that was acceptable. There was quite a lot of information to learn from this thing's file. The specs for the time weren't terrible, and there was a variety of different configurations that were available. To highlight what this particular model has built into it, it is as follows. According to the report, there was an Intel Core Duo Processor Ultra Low Wattage, which was the U2500. Nothing to laugh at. The memory would be tastefully upgraded to around one gigabyte. 
everything else was pretty standard. However, in this particular unit, it has been swapped out for a solid state drive to give it its best chance of being even remotely relevant in today's age. The odds were stacked against it, the whole thing stank. The only way I was going to get answers, and I couldn't avoid it any longer, was going on the inside. Entry, as I figured, would start from the back. But despite all of the security, I was very much prepared. The first I figured that we would need to take care of is the power. Cut the power, we kill any alarms that might go off when we do our infiltration. Since we knew we weren't supposed to be there, this was the best option we had in finding answers once we were on the inside. It was quite clear from the screws on the bottom that it had earned its IP rating. Dust proof, no problem, and splash resistant from all sides. Once these screws were loosened, the cover came away, revealing the main battery. It was quite clear that it was a large component of the unit, 3900 milliamps. This battery, if you had to try and find one, God have mercy on your soul, <laughs> because it looks like it was proprietary. It's also interesting to note that it had a battery connector on the back that would allow for a second battery to be attached to the unit. I like to think of it as an accomplice battery. Now that the battery has been removed from the system, we can take a look on the inside of some of the components that are accessible from the top view. First off, taped into place, we have our Intel Wi-Fi card sticking out suspiciously, being suspicious. Moving along the top hand side, we can see one of the RAM slots. Looks like two gigabytes was shoved into this unit, probably as much as it could possibly hold. It was clear everything that could have been done was done to this unit. How it even managed to accept that much RAM without exploding is beyond me. I also took pictures to make sure that we knew what kind of Wi-Fi card was in it, because I knew people would be asking me questions back at the station. With the first half disassembled, I knew that there was only more waiting for me on the other side. I pulled out my screwdriver and quickly continued going to work. I was being lured into a false sense of security. Disassembly of the unit had been a breeze. Screws were accessible, panels easily removed, definitely showed a high quality of machining. Everything felt rigid, in place, and incredibly durable. With a great degree of difficulty, the panel was removed. Inside, what was waiting for me was not something that I initially expected to see. The heat sink was a weird shape. That was no question about it. But what particularly intrigued me was the hard drive and how it was assembled. It seemed to have a pull tab, which looked familiar, but that's where the similarity seemed to end. It was an incredibly snug fit. And, lo and behold, underneath lay the release cable. I found that it was taped in place. It seems like it was configurable with different sizes of hard disk. That this was maybe left over from a larger uh, IDE hard drive style. The one part that I quickly discovered upon examining the drive is that the ribbon cable had two jobs. The first was obviously to provide power to the unit and read the data off of the drive. The other, however, was a far, far more unique and interesting feature, and it was actually to heat the hard drive. That's right, not only was the drive insulated, protected by a springy foam, but the whole entire bay was heated and intentionally kept warm. This allowed the machine to operate in temperatures up to, but not including, minus 60 degrees Celsius. Clearly, built tough was not just a marketing ploy. One thing was clear as I was finalizing my report is that even though it may be rugged, durable, and all around a good performer, this thing's days was numbered. It was quite clear from the battery specs there was a lot to be concerned about. And while it might be one of the most durable portable tablets, how long it would remain portable was yet to be seen. There was a lot of features in this thing that would have made it a contender during its day. But during the time frame what that General Dynamics was working in, the Dual Touch 2 was antiquated in just about every way by the standards that would precede it in the following years. 
while it is a robust device, no one can deny it that, there is a certain amount of limited usability for a device like this, unless it's tethered permanently to a power supply. That brought this case file to a close. It was bittersweet, but I knew that it was an awful good machine for what it did. The question was, of course, was it going to be able to do it anymore, or were its days numbered to that of the Stateville's prison? It was becoming clear to me as I undid the fourth screw that this thing was more screwed up than Sally Decker after shooting twice.